So we're going to begin our lesson on the names of God and the names of Jesus. Now, in our modern society, so we're talking about names and titles. We're kind of using them inter interchangeably. We're not going to make a great distinction between them. But um, in our modern society, a title is not just a way of designating a person, but it also signifies aspects about that person's powers and responsibilities. For instance, the title President of the United States represents the head of the executive branch of government, responsible, among other things, for appointing judges and positions of office in the United States government. The president also has another title, and the title is Commander-in-Chief. By this title, he commands all the U.S. armed forces in the world. Now, these are two different titles for the same position. The title of president and commander-in-chief are given to a person through an election by people. Now, in contrast, the names and titles of God are different. The names and titles of God are far and above any human name or title, and they are not assignable to him by anyone else. Judges 13, 18 says, The Lord's messenger said to him, You should not ask me my name, because you cannot comprehend it. Although God has many titles, we will look at just four titles of God the Father and five titles of Jesus Christ. Let's start by looking at a few titles of God the Father. These are titles prior to his revealing of Christ to the whole of humanity. The first one is El Shaddai. God Almighty. This was a special name by which God revealed himself to the patriarchs. The Hebrew possibly means God the mountain, emphasizing God's might. Genesis 17.1 says, When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the sovereign God. Walk before me and be blameless. Next we have the living God. This title emphasizes that God is real and alive in contrast to worthless idols. When idol makers carved idols out of wood, they thought they were actually creating gods, which is completely false. God, on the other hand, is the God of creation. He is not part of creation. He created the wood that the idol makers made the idols out of. Psalm 84 verse two says, I desperately want to be in the courts of the Lord's temple. My heart and my entire being Shout for joy to the living God. The next title is Abba, which means Father. Now, there's no revelation of God as Father in the Old Testament that's comparable to that that Jesus refers to in his prayer, Our Father. There's, the intimacy is lacking back then. Isaiah uses the term Father to prophesize that Jesus would be equal to the Father in stature and in function, and ability, and in responsibility. Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us. He shoulders responsibility, and is called Extraordinary Strategist, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Amen. Now the next title of God, name for God, is Yahweh. And this refers to God's self-existence. It's built on the word for I am. It reveals God's nature in the highest and fullest sense possible. The word appears tetragrammed as Y-H-W-H 6,823 times in the Old Testament. Its first appearance is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and heavens. So the term for Lord is Yahweh. Jesus reveals that he is equal to God the Father in John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. The term for I am, Yahweh. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now when someone, a skeptic, comes up to you and says, Jesus never said he was God, you can point to verses like this. This is... This is far above and beyond just simply saying, I am God. He's saying, he's using one of the titles, one of the names of God to show his majesty and his equality with the one and only living God, Yahweh. Right. This is a powerful statement. 
Now, of course, the unbelieving Jews picked up stones to throw at him because they knew that he was declaring himself to be equal to God. There are many more titles of God, but as you can see, we can learn a lot about who God is just by looking at a few of his titles. Now that we've looked at titles of God the Father, let's look at five titles of Jesus Christ. Four of these titles are in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And our fifth title is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the first title we'll look at is the Christ, the anointed one. Christ is the official title given to Jesus in the New Testament. The word comes from the Greek word Christos, which means, which translates the Hebrew title for Messiah. John chapter 1 verse 41 says, He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Both terms Messiah and Christ come from verbs meaning to anoint with sacred oil. Hence, as titles, they mean the anointed one. When applied to Jesus, they show that he has divine appointment for his office and function. His divine anointing was foreshadowed in the Old Testament by three groups of anointed officials. And they are prophets, priests, and kings. Let's look at prophets first. Moses was the first Old Testament prophet whose ministry prophesied that Jesus would come. Deuteronomy 18.18 18 says, I will raise up a prophet like you for them from among their fellow Israelites. I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them whatever I command. And John 6.14, Now when the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus performed, they began to say to one another, This is certainly the prophet who is to come into the world. You see, they were referring back to that verse in recognizing Jesus as the prophet that was being prophesied. The next is priests. All priests from Aaron onward were ordained by anointing with oil and required consecration rites. Exodus 28, 41 says, You are to clothe him, clothe them, your brother Aaron and his sons with him, and anoint them and ordain them and set them apart as holy so that they may minister as my priests. And Leviticus 21, verse 10 says, The high priest, who is greater than his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil is poured, who has been ordained to wear the priestly garments, must neither dishevel the hair of his head nor tear his garments. And as we know from the New Testament, Jesus is the great high priest. Amen. Hebrews 2.17 says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God, to make atonement for the sins of the people. The next position is kings. The kings of Israel, beginning with Saul and David, were anointed as a sign of divine choice and approval. Let's look at David. The people wanted a king so that they would be like the other nations. 1 Samuel 8, 5. They said to him, Look, you are old and your sons don't follow your ways. So now appoint over us a king to lead us, just like all the other nations have. By asking for a king, they were rejecting the Lord as the king. Right. The Lord complied with their request. 1 Samuel 8, 7, the Lord said to Samuel, do everything the people request of you, for it is not you they have rejected, but it is me that they have rejected as their king. The Lord then told Samuel to warn the people of what life would be like under a king. 1 Samuel 8, verses 11 through 18, he said, Here are the policies of the king who will rule over you. He will conscript your sons and put them in his chariot forces and in his cavalry. They will run in front of his chariot. He will appoint for himself leaders of thousands and leaders of fifties, as well as those who plow his ground, reap his harvest, and make his weapons of war and his chariot equipment. He will take your daughters to be ointment makers, cooks, and bakers. He will take your best fields and vineyards and give them to his own servants. He will demand a tenth of your seed and of the produce of your vineyards and give it to his administrators and his servants. He will take your male and female servants as well as your best cattle 
and your donkeys and assign them for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will be his servants. In that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord won't answer you in that day. Without naming any names, I can think of a few nations like this. There are countless nations throughout history who've rejected the Lord and they chose an earthly king. And these were the consequences that they suffered. The people refused to hear the warning and chose Saul to rule over them. In a short amount of time, Saul was rejected. In 1 Samuel 16, God called Samuel to one of the sons of Jesse. All of Jesse's sons appeared, but none were to be the anointed one. Do you have any other sons? Oh, we have David, but he's out tending the sheep. They send for young David. As soon as he enters, God speaks to Samuel. Rise and anoint him. He is the one. The internal reality of anointing was the gift of the Spirit to the recipient. 1 right. Samuel 16, 13 says, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Now, in terms of kings, we know that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Revelation 19, 16. He has a name written on his clothing and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's look at Jesus' baptism. This was actually God's anointing of Jesus, if you'll recall. The anointed person was not a free agent. Okay, as a prophet, priest, or king, he spoke, served, or ruled in the name of the Lord and as his representative to the people of God. The Gospels portray Jesus as accepting the title and role of Messiah Christ. His baptism should be understood as his anointing to the threefold office of prophet, priest, and king, as we just went over. At his baptism by John, Jesus received the outpouring of the Spirit and God's mandate to begin his ministry. Amen. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. After Jesus was baptized, just as he was coming up out of the water, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my one dear Son, in him I take great delight. Now for us, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, this is the most basic and earliest article of the Christian confession. Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, affirming that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the role of anointed prophet, priest, and king as the servant of God for his people. This title of the Christ, of Messiah, is supremely important. And all the Old Testament was looking towards this. If you recall from a couple weeks ago, there are shadows of Christ. This was all looking forward to Christ's anointing with the Holy Spirit. Let's look at another title of Christ, Son of David. Jesus is described as the Son of David in 17 verses in the New Testament. This is a messianic title that refers to Jesus fulfilling the prophecy that the Messiah would be a descendant through the line of David. 2 Samuel 7 verses 12 through 13 says, When the time comes for you to die, I will raise up your descendant, one of your own sons, to succeed you. And I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will make his dynasty permanent. Now, in case you decide to read further in there, I want to give a, a word of caution. Verse 14 talks about when he sins, but we all know that Christ never sinned. But when he says this, he's referring to David's descendants up to Christ. Okay, Christ himself never sinned. It, it was a shadow. This is very common in the Old Testament. There'll be a, uh, an immediate or near-term fulfillment, and then there's the long-term fulfillment that we see much later. Matthew chapter 1 gives a genealogical proof that Jesus in his humanity was a direct descendant of Abraham and David through Joseph, Jesus' legal father. The genealogy in Luke 3 shows Jesus' lineage through his mother Mary. 
Jesus is a descendant of David by adoption through Joseph and by blood through Mary. Romans 1.3 says, Concerning his son, who is a descendant of David, with reference to the flesh. The next title is the son of Abraham. This title takes Christ's royal lineage all the way back to Israel's inception in the Abrahamic covenant. All families of the earth were to be blessed through Abraham. Genesis 12 verses 1 through 3 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Abram, not Abraham yet, Go out from your country, your relatives, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Then I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will exemplify divine blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but the one who treats you lightly, I must curse. And all the families of the earth will bless one another by your name. Abraham, as he would become, would also be the father of a multitude of nations, which is what the name Abraham means. Genesis 17, verse 5, No longer will your name be Abram. Instead, your name will be Abraham, because I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. Jesus came in fulfillment of the kingdom promises to David and of the Gentile blessings promises to Abraham. Matthew 28, 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. As such, Jesus was the prophesied descendant of Abraham. Galatians 3, 16 now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his descendant. Scripture does not say, and to the descendants, referring to many, but, and to your descendant, referring to one who is Christ. Okay, now, Jesus, the name Jesus, the title Jesus. It means Savior. Matthew one twenty one. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The root of this name, to save, gave rise to other names such as Joshua, Hosea, and Hosea. The Hebrew term for Jesus is Yeshua. Joshua, by bringing Israel into Canaan, the promised land, in Joshua chapters 1 through 24, we won't read those right now, it'll take a while, fulfilled the meaning of his name by saving them. Likewise, in the New Testament, Jesus saves people from their sins by restoring fellowship with God and bringing them into the paradise of the heavenly kingdom, like the safe, wide-open place of Canaan. The next title, the next name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Emmanu means with us, and El means God. If you recall earlier, one of the names of God was El Shaddai. There are many other names of God to start with L. L basically means God. In the book of Isaiah, a child born in the time of King Ahaz was given the name Emmanuel as a sign to the king that Judah would receive relief from attacks by Israel and Syria. Isaiah 7:14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. The name Emmanuel reminded his people that he would establish his guiding and protecting presence in their deliverance. And this points to Jesus, our Messiah. So let's look at Jesus' birth, the Christmas story. Several hundred years after King Ahaz, Mary, a virgin, was engaged to Joseph. Before they were married, an angel visited Joseph and told him that Mary had conceived a child through the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1, verses 20 through 21. When he had contemplated this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. When the child was born, they were to name him Jesus, understanding the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Matthew tells us of this fulfillment through the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, 
which means God with us. Now, when we understand the titles of Christ, we can better understand who he is from these titles. The Messiah who would save us from our sins by dying on the cross. When we repent, when we turn from our sins, we put our trust in him. He will become our great high priest. He will restore our relationship with God the Father so that we too can call God our Father. Now that you know what these titles of Christ mean, you can better appreciate the true meaning of Christmas. While others are getting wrapped up in presents and following government orders to watch vapid holiday specials on TV instead of getting together to celebrate, keep this in mind. Have an attitude of thanksgiving and find somebody to share it with. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for uh, revealing who you are throughout the Old Testament, Lord, all pointing towards your son, Lord, the epicenter, everything pointing towards your son, the wonderful gift that you gave us through your son, Lord. Thank you for giving us different ways of remembering the wonderful things that he did that show who you are, Lord, by giving us things like names and titles. Lord, we pray that you just give us a worshipful heart this season, that you'd write the commandments on our hearts, Lord, and that we would just practice them with joy. In Jesus' name, amen.